my name is Lynette Roth, and I'm the Daimler Curator of the Bushreisinger Museum and head of the Division of Modern and Contemporary Art, and I'm going to be serving as a moderator for our Q&A later on. Uh, before we begin today's program, uh, the Harvard Art Museums uh, would like to acknowledge that Harvard University is situated on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Massachusetts people, and we at the university strive to honor this relationship. So I'm very pleased uh, that you've uh, decided to join us again uh, for our series, our talks live, uh, which I know we have a lot of return uh, participants, um, but for those of you who are new to our series, uh, we do offer an up close look at works from our collections with our team of curators, conservators, fellows, and graduate students. And uh, the series takes place every other Thursday afternoon on Zoom at 2 p.m. And these short interactive talks investigate artist materials and techniques, reveal our latest discoveries, offer a fresh look at old favorites, and explore big ideas using the collections of the Harvard Art Museums. And today's talk actually continues our series entitled Power Dynamics, which considers how artists and artworks from across our collections mm -hmm. engage with social and political crises, upset systems of power, and imagine more equitable futures. So just a few logistics before we begin. Uh, we are again using our webinar format in Zoom. So you'll want to submit your brief questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. The presentation today will be about 15 minutes and the last 15 minutes or so will be dedicated to the Q&A. So it's great if you have the questions while um, Mary is speaking, you can go ahead and put them in the Q&A box and we're gonna wrap up today uh, at around 2.30 p.m. So now I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Mary Schneider Enriquez, who is the Houghton Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Harvard Art Museum. <laughs> Mary's scholarly interests focus on the 20th and 21st century global art with a special emphasis on art from Latin America, art and politics, sculpture and installation. That's why I'm thrilled uh, that we get a chance to hear from Mary today on an artist that she has spent uh, a very long time thinking about uh, writing on, researching uh, and um, communicating with, and that's Doris Salcedo. Uh, many of you will remember that Mary was the curator of the breathtaking special exhibition in 2016 at the Harvard Art Museums entitled Doris Salcedo, The Materiality of Mourning. And that exhibition, as I'm sure Mary will address also featured uh, very important acquisitions by Salcedo that Mary made for the collection um, of the Fogg Museum. So I'm pleased to turn it over to Mary and look forward to our conversation afterwards. Thank you, Lynette. Welcome everyone. I, I look forward to sharing with you my passion, interest, and all that I can share about Dora Salcedo's work. As Lynette mentioned, I was able to do an exhibition of her work in 2016-17 at the art museums. And this particular work I'm gonna talk about today and focus on, the chair you see before you, was an integral part of that exhibition as well as other objects. So this is the chair. And the title, as I said, um, uh, of this talk today is Sculpture as Witness because Salcedo's practice focuses on and always has political violence. And this comes from her own life experience and her own focus in the world that she lives in and has always lived in. Doris is from Colombia. She was born in 1958 and although has traveled and did a master's degree at NYU in sculpture, she has lived in Bogota and all her life and lives there now. So much of her practice and the work that we're going to focus on comes out of living in a world that has been at civil war until 2016, but continues to be a place in which war and political violence is very much a part of daily life, quite literally. So I wanna give you a, a little bit of a context for this beyond those words. When I talk about violence over more than 50 years, Colombia has been in a civil war that has reached an impact that until 2016, killed more than 260,000 people 
And I say that number today, realizing that we are facing in the United States deaths of more than 250,000 from the pandemic. So when I did this talk and show, I should say, exhibition a few years ago, that number staggered me. The idea that I can say the same is true in our country today takes me to a point of silence. It is an enormous number. But in addition to the deaths in Colombia, going back to that country in this situation, we also had more than 7 million people displaced through civil war. And the result of that is people are refugees in their own country. They do not have home, they do not have place to live, and they have lost in their lives, not only that domestic interior, that home, but they've lost people, friends, and family to war. This chair, this sculpture, and Salcedo's work comes out of those conditions in that context of political violence. And all of her work comes from research and talking to victims over a lengthy period of time before she creates this chair and the many other pieces I'm gonna show you in context with this. So everything is coming from the perspective of talking with others, learning from victims what they've experienced and trying to address the violence they've suffered and the absence and loss they continue to live with. So before I delve into the detail about this extraordinary chair, which I wish I could show you in person, and one day I will again, I'm gonna give you a little more context. This is where Salcedo began. In the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, she came back from her master's degree at NYU in sculpture, as I said, and she began to create work that dealt with political violence, but focusing on domestic furniture as her base. So she took use domestic furniture, the, the works, the, the pieces the, that you would find in someone's home in their private space that was their space of comfort and safety, that which we all recognize as something that is familiar to us. So for example, these two examples, the one on the left in which you have a bureau, but in the most strange and typical of, of Salcedo's ways, this bureau has been bisected by a bed frame of all things. Again, something we would all recognize fused together in this strange pairing that is very unsettling. And furthermore, uh, it, it is filled with, as you can see, another example on the right here, of this bureau that has filled with cement. So the most unlikely materials are combined, very typical of her work. The work on the right in further detail is the kind of chest you would see expected to be filled with sheets and towels, folded sweaters and blouses. But instead, as you, the viewer, peer in the windows it, through the quote unquote glass, you find the dead silence of cement, very minimalist, very flat. And within it, struggling to, to be at the surface, you find the collar and the bodice of a little girl's dress, you find the torn cuffs of a man's shirt, or the lacy um, collar of a woman's blouse. What she did in her earliest work is she would use used furniture from domestic interiors, and she would find remnants of those who were no longer here. So in a way that deeply unnerves you, you come up to this beautiful piece of furniture, you look closer and what you find struggling to quote unquote breathe at the surface are these drowned and suffocated pieces of clothing from those who are lost. This was some of her earliest work. And next in the 90s, another perfect example of what is so key to her is this series called Unland Series. This is shown in the left at an um, installation at Site Santa Fe. And you see three elongated tables. Each of these tables is a fusion and a melding of two very awkward and strange other tables. Um, held together in a way that they become almost like giant creatures. They're unwieldy. They look as if they could tip over. They stand there waiting for you in this very spare interior to walk around them and look closely. That is key to her work and ties to our chair in a very deliberate way. Because what you see when you look closely is the image on the right. The first table closest to us in the left-hand slide, looking closely at that what is looks like a white area you see this and what you see here is clothing, a piece of cloth sewn, adhered to the surface of this wood, sewn there with human hair. 
appears first like black threads, but in fact, it has the shine and it is in fact human hair that's, that ties it to the surface, that it hears it so closely. Very much about what she does, which she does the impossible. She fills wooden furniture with cement, something that could never really work and, and somehow does. And she makes this cloth and this hair literally sew into the wood. This is a very deliberate story. This story and this piece is called The Orphan's Tunic. And as I said, she does all of her research on site before she creates a piece. She was in an area in which, which some horrific violence occurred in, in Colombia. She noticed day after day, a little girl, a little girl wearing the same dress each day. She learned later, this little girl had seen her parents taken from her, never to be returned in this war. And she wore this dress every day, the dress her mother had made her never taking it off. So this orphan's tunic is a deliberate reference to and memory of this poor child and what this war has actually done to communities in Colombia. How does this lead us to our chair? Well, first the chair, which is called Untitled in our collection, in fact, is the first work and she did a series of different kinds of chairs I'm going to show you that were in the exhibition, um, were the first works that she created completely from scratch, that they're all entirely made by her. It's not a found object she's reusing. It's not a piece or a remnant of someone else's life. It is entirely sculpted from stainless steel by Salcedo, done in pieces. And I wanna show you why. This here is an installation that she created. It's actually a performance piece. October 6th and 7th of 2002, on the 17th anniversary of a tragedy in the center of Bogota, she created this piece. The images on the left are time lapse or, or taken over time as this installation slash performance progressed. What this was, was in the, the historical incident was in 1985, November 6th and 7th, guerrillas entered the Supreme Court building in the center of Bogota. This is the, the Supreme Court building as it stands today. They entered, took over the building. The military was sent in, a war of violence erupted. Ultimately, a fire erupted. And by the next day, everyone within the building was killed. Everyone knew about this, and it was obviously a huge event and tragedy for all to suffer from. It burned the Supreme Court building down. Everyone was killed, as I said. So what she created in 2002 on the 17th anniversary with no public announcement, I will say, so this was a surprise to the passersby you see on the street down here, is starting at the exact moment the siege began at 11 a.m. She started to lower a single chair over the side of the wall of the building and then a neck and more chairs. And little by little over 27 hours, all the chairs are lowered to the, each of them, 128 of them, each commemorating a person no longer here because of the violence from this war. Hanging haphazardly, hanging in a fragile and disassembled manner, each of them once touched, meaning they once touched someone who's no longer here because of war. Nothing was left from this event. And as I said, she tries to begin each work with a remnant from and an interview with those who have suffered through this violence. Nothing was left from the incredible scorching and burning of this building. So to create a commemorating piece, which our chair is as a next level in her um, practice, she had to start from scratch. One more chair related incident or creation by her. In 2003, she was invited to do an installation at the Biennial in Istanbul. And she collected over many, many weeks, chairs from all over the country, more than 1,550 of them. She poured, so to speak, into a vacant lot she was given as the site of her installation. It's between three buildings, each four stories high. She layered one upon another in an incredibly complicated way, even though it may look like they're all just thrown together. And I, I had the opportunity to speak at length with her about this, creating a wall of chairs. So you see the gentleman at the, at the bottom walking by a street that is full of hardware stores. And instead you see layer upon layer upon layer of chairs that look like they will fall and flood over you, each a body no longer there. And in this case, representing the hundreds of thousands of Armenians and Greeks killed by the Turks in World War I. 
connecting again, as is her way to political violence. Our chair, stainless steel, made entirely. This installation is part of what was in my exhibition, the material out of morning of, of Doris's work, one of the galleries. So you see a whole collection of stainless steel chairs that she created. A number of them fused together in a strange and kind of monstrous way, split open, gouged, crumpled, but together in mass, several of them. Here's the entire gallery. And I show you this to give you a sense in this installation I did with her and the very deliberate starkness and strangeness of these collection was very much a part of as she puts it, once this kind of horrific violence has occurred, nothing in life is normal again. And there's a hollow haunting sense of where will and how will life ever be the same. Our chair at Harvard Art Museums is right here, leaning against the wall you see from a distance this whole right-hand side of it is bent and odd, and it's not really the kind of chair one would sit in. So let's look at it. What you have here, as I said, she created each of these chairs I've just shown you, but our chair in particular was made from the beginning on scratch. And so how did she do that? She took a basic chair, a basic chair that would be common in Colombia, but would be recognizable to everyone, but truly in Colombia, everyone recognized it. A basic wooden chair, the kind of straight, simple wooden chair that would be around a kitchen table so that when the food comes off the fire or the stove, it's right there, the family, the people are gathered together and everyone is seated on a chair, the chair again, representing a body. She's taken that basic wooden chair and, and, and created, a wax prototype of this chair. And in this prototype, she created areas that you see um, to this back corner that are crumpled, that have creases in them, that are all completely unlike what you would see in wood or certainly what you wouldn't see in stainless steel or expect to see in stainless steel. So this is our, our, our chair up a little more closely. This image on the left is looking at the seat towards the back and you see all these layers and folds that are on the seat. So it's not a, a flat surface one would sit on. And the smaller image, I apologize, which is not great, but under COVID I couldn't get a better image. You've got here um, completely crumpled back end. So like indented here, gouged, again, as if it was crumpled almost like paper. So. She created these in wax, the, the prototype. She then sent the wax prototype in pieces. It was all taken in pieces and it was sent to a foundry and cast in stainless steel in a foundry in New York state. Then all these pieces of chair were sent back to her studio in Bogota and then they were put together, put together piece by piece and, and screwed together and placed together. So she did several kinds of chairs, but they took all the pieces in, in heavy stainless steel. And here you see, I'm, I'm showing my colleague, Molly Ryan, how these were put together. And you see that underneath, you know, this process. But what is so particularly interesting is this detail work here that I said, the crumple of stainless steel. Stainless steel, which weighs it, much more than it appears. They appear to be almost like those aluminum chairs you see in people's yards, even in Harvard yard. But in fact, each of these chairs, our chair weighs so much I can't move it. So it's totally solid and doing the impossible here, as I say, crumpled. But more importantly, I focus you here. What they did in addition to putting it together piece by piece is they took dental tools, she and her assistants, and by hand, carved into the stainless steel surface, this entire wood grain you see here, the wood grain, the deeper cut in the edge of the wood, these gashes, there are nail holes, there are other gashes in the legs and elsewhere that look as if it is used wood. It defies the idea of stainless steel because we think of stainless steel as cool, smooth, very minimalist and beautiful. And it becomes here very much a kind of evocative, sensual, textured, almost malleable and bendable and nimble kind of surface when in fact it is not at all. This is hard as can be and heavy as can be. 
And also one of our worries in the installation was people touching it, it leaves incredible fingerprints if someone touches it. So it's not user-friendly in, in, in the sensual way that wood would be. It in fact is very much the incredible metal that, that we think of stainless steel. She deliberately created them in this silver cool form, but it has a surface that suggests that body was once there. She is presenting to us this sculpture as witness, witness to violence, witness to those who are no longer with us, leaving a trace. And the suggestion by the crumpling, of course, is perhaps the chair was used in the violence itself, or it was it, it, it too was afflicted and the witness who once sat in this chair around that kitchen table in that small kitchen is no longer here. We very much feel their absence. And that is very deliberately what she sought to create. So as we look at this chair, it is both an extraordinary sculpture because it's amazing she was able to do it. Its simplicity is striking. But as you look closer, just as you needed to do with her earlier works I started this talk with, as you look closer, it is when you slowly discern what is so disturbing and also so extraordinary about the surface she's created, about what she's been able to completely create in stainless steel. It creates, she creates a skin, a material presence and trace for those who are no longer here. And I will close with one last object in our collection, another work by Dora Salcedo called A Fleur de Piel. This work was also in the exhibition in 2016. It is an enormous tapestry, a textile that covers the floor, fills a room, and was created by Doris in a very deliberate statement to a, someone who was killed in the war. A, a nurse who was kidnapped and tortured to death in Colombia was someone Doris did not have the chance to meet, would never be able to see in person, whose body was gone and she wanted to create an offering to her. Her offering, her memorial of sorts, was to create a shroud of flowers and these are flowers. This textile, the opposite of stainless steel that will endure and endure, is in fact made of rose petals and here is a detail. Thousands and thousands and thousands of rose petals she collected over time, she figured out a way she and her assistants to immerse it in various chemicals that would allow it to, to continue to exist on some level and then make it pliable enough so that they could be sewn together. These are sewn together, each of these rose petals, and in fact, sewn with thread that is thick. So it's very much like suturing, like you're suturing a wound, creating a space in which there is to be healing, but you will always have a scar. This skin, this wound, these flowers become a tribute to this nurse and to so many else who have died in violence and in political violence. But what is also very interesting, again, in the opposite of the stainless steel is that this is an organic material. This is an organic material that she has pushed to the point of being suspended between life and death. And it will always be the statement, this, this, this sense of the skin, the flesh, the wound, that takes us to remember this violence and what it's done, but remember those, those individuals who are no longer with us because of this war. And I close with this, particularly at this moment, as we think about how do we remember people through all that occurs in the world, um, pandemic and political violence, and the ways in which art can speak to those who are never with us again, how we will always remember them, and how an artist like Salcedo gives us the chance to remember, to think, and to hold on to what life is, and to say goodbye to those who are no longer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, we already have some wonderful questions in the Q&A, and in fact, one follows on um, what you just said, which I think is, you know, something in the foremost of all of our minds uh, right now. And um, the question was, you know, how you feel Salcedo's work has facilitated empathy towards victims of violence and suffering. And um, is that channeling um, of emotions, um, our participant asks, is that considered activism? Hmm. It's a great question for Salcedo in particular, um, because her work 
Interestingly enough, in Colombia, I'm going to start with this. I said she's lived there her whole life. In Colombia, there's a mixed feeling towards her because she is such an activist with her work. Um, for example, something I was going to include, but I knew it was going to make my talk too long, is in 2016, at the time that the peace agreement in Colombia to end the war was being signed and there was a public vote and many people voted it down, she brought together, invited anybody in the community, all of Colombia, to come together in the city center and create a memorial in the center of the city where this palace of justice was and to write on these huge sheets of cloth a name of a victim who has never been found who's never been accounted for whose death has never had a funeral stone and to side to to sew together these sheets with these names and cover like a white shroud of remembrance the entire center of the city with this it was incredibly beautiful and it had literally the names of those who died, which you've noticed everything I've talked about, she doesn't talk about actual names of victims, even the nurse I mentioned or the little girl. Names are not used in her work. They're meant to suggest many people, even though it's specific. And her, she was widely criticized for doing this work at the time of the discussion on the peace agreement because they felt that her bringing people together, people came on their own volition. It wasn't that she paid them or something because they wanted to remember people. Um, people felt that it was typical of her work that she was doing the kind of criticism of the government that was more important than her own work. And they thought, see her as too much of an activist political force when in fact, I, I, I'm gonna be biased of course, cause I've known her for a long time. So much of what her work is about is actually trying to give attention to and address those who are silent and always will be and don't have the means to ever um, get politicians to pay attention to who they lost in their family. Um, so I see it's it she she walks a, a, a line in Colombia in which there are so many who love her and believe that she's she as I know she does she spends a lot of time with those families who've lost so many. Um, she has brought attention and empathy. They also think that she's been politicized by this and she's too much of an activist and that gets in the way of her art. But I would say that's what her art is about. So mm -hmm. it's a very long answer because it's oh, not that's a great. That's a great answer. Um, we had uh, a question also about her use of familiar personal domestic items. So you started out with the bed and the bureau from the 80s and obviously the chair. Um, why do you think uh, she um, uses those personal items to represent um, the horrific expanse of war and violence is the, the question here in the chat. Well, she began um, her work actually going out to areas of the country. There's certain areas of Columbia, if, if you are not familiar with this, this, this whole history, um, where more of the violence has occurred and it's usually in areas where the drug trade has been huge and the poverty is extreme. And she has spent a lot of time and in, in, in the beginning in particular, she would go out and talk to the mothers who lost their sons because a lot of, a lot of males were, were disappeared by the military so that they could tell their, their generals in the government that they had captured a bunch of guerrillas, meaning the, the, far, the leftist group. And in fact, they didn't always do that. They were just taking young men and accusing young men. And my point is, I'm not gonna go into sides on all this, but she talked to a lot of mothers who lost their, their children to war. And in, in the very early on stage, she told me, of, she created a work called the Turbularios with, with shoes, found shoes. And she told me about how she went to these mass graves with the mothers. So these holes in the ground with the mothers searching for, because they hadn't seen their son. They don't know where their children were, both men and women, I should say, not just boys. Um, searching through these mass graves for a shoe that would say, that was my daughter, that was my son and collected them with them. And it was this, this on the one sense, a kind of relic, a, a very vivid memory. It touched the body of my child or my 
my sibling or um and so it was the beginning of how she thought about what she would create to give back to address the violence and to to create the memory and and honor to those we will never see again nor do we have any idea where they are so i would say it was it was really one of the kernels of the beginning for her was the cloth or the object from inside the house that the mother or father sat on every day waiting for their child to come home mm -hmm. um it was the human trace that was part of these found objects that was the kernel behind everything else she created at the beginning. Yeah, there's a, a wonderful question in the chat that's kind of related to that as well. You were mentioning the relic and the, the fact that, you know, she began with these objects that really did bear a, a direct relationship um, to the people uh, who had been victimized. And the question has to do with then uh, the transformation of something as in the chair, as opposed to the chairs that were used in the performance. Um, uh, the, um, the question is, you know, is, is there anything diminished or lost uh, when she begins to create the work from scratch, as opposed to those found objects that carry with them their, their history? It's a great question. My answer would be that, um, there is definitely a difference, but I find that the work, including the rose petal piece, but our chair to the rose petal piece to a lot of her later works in which grass grows through, I mean, there's a lot of different examples I could give, but um, her process of making, which is so fastidious and includes just this focused repetition and and the, the, the use of handwork, whether it's sewing the rose petals or carving the, with dental tools into the, the surface of these, that whole process and ritual is very much a part of the way Salcedo connects to those who are no longer here. So I see the way in which she works and how completely focused, almost obsessively focused to keep doing, keep doing, that act of remembrance is literally her act of making is as much connecting to those individuals as it is in a different way, the actual shoe that was somebody's. Um, um, it becomes her making, that she, in fact, she, she and I have talked about this, her work has become over time increasingly she pushed herself to do the more impossible, the more difficult to do, because it was she had to find a way to give back to address what it was that people were suffering and to remember. And so I would say the act of, of creating mm -hmm. and is takes the place of, or is a different means of, of really speaking to and honoring and addressing those. Yeah, that also answers another one of the questions we had that, that was actually about the, that kind of detailed manual process as opposed to a kind of industrialized production. And, uh, we're going to have to wrap it up, but I wanted to ask you one final question. Um, so the series that we're doing now, Power Dynamics, was really intended uh, to give us an opportunity to look at artworks in the collection that may have been made in very different times. So we looked at 18th century France two weeks ago, and in two weeks we're going to look at uh, ancient Rome. Uh, and obviously today with Salcedo's work, you know, Colombia and um, and the violence there. And you mentioned at the outset, the victims of COVID-19 and um, could tell that you were also very uh, touched by this as you were thinking about Salcedo's work. And I was wondering, you know, we've talked a lot about commemoration and yeah. um, mourning or even the sort of activists drawing attention to the topic. Is there something that you see in the work of Salcedo in maybe these connections that she builds or that could also be a hopeful message as we're thinking today um, mm -hmm. about uh, the current pandemic? I, I do actually, I mean, she, when you've lived, she had um, 50 years of having a kind of random but constant violence in your living situation, um, which in fact is what happens for most Colombians, um, you learn ways to, to keep looking forward and to find um, a strength in what, in her case, I think is the example I would answer with, that sense of creating 
and giving back is part of being alive and being thankful for what we have, as well as remembering those who are, are no longer with us. And I think in, in, in our world, I feel very fortunate to be working with art because I see it as something, just as you pointed to three different examples of what's gonna be discussed in, in power dynamics, from the ancient times to the present, art has been a means for society and individuals to express a sense of hope and despair, but an enduring sense of what human beings can do and create that will get us through, get us through the most difficult times and give us a, a way to, to act and believe and to think and to, to hold on to what is precious and also recognize what, what is lost if we don't hold on to it. And I, so I see her work has always done that for me. It's me. It makes me very sad, but I think that sadness allows me to see the extraordinary ability we have as human beings to let our spirit create and, and give us a way forward as we recognize what we're living. Thank you, that's really <laughs> wonderful. And um, as always, I'm, I'm so grateful to hear from you, Mary, and, uh, and also um, hear more about your own uh, passion for the work and your own uh, dedication to it. So thank you very much. And I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, as usual, you'll receive an online survey after this. So please take the time to send us your feedback and join us in two weeks as we continue this series, Power Dynamics. On December 17th, we're going to hear from Amy Brower, who is our curator of the collections in the Division of Asian and Mediterranean Art on the public images of rulers in ancient Rome with a talk entitled Erased. So we're looking forward to that. And of course, you can always visit our online calendar for more information about these and all of our other uh, upcoming online programs. So thank you again, Mary, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you. <laughs>